be playing, Emma. through a whole verse and then we're going to sing. Okay. All right, guys. We are here. I know the roads are better in some places than in others, but with the um, <clears throat> garrison telling you all to stay home, I thought it was unwise of me to ask you to come out. So I did miss uh, at least one. Miss Katie showed up. Um, so I'm sorry I failed to tell everybody, but it was in the church thread and I uh, messaged one or two that aren't in the church thread for some reason, but uh, I did fail to tell a couple. Anyway, sorry about that. I don't think I told uh, Captain Josh Clements either, but we're going to sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus. If my voice holds out, we're going to sing all three verses, okay? If you have a book, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. so faithful who will all our sorrows share Jesus knows our every weakness take it to the Lord in prayer on the last are we weak and heavy Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a soul lost there. Amen. That last verse, boy, it's really, it's really touching. It's really moving. Are we weak and heavy laden? You know, do we have a bunch of burdens and we don't feel like we can carry them? Are we cumbered? Are we, are we buckled down with a load of care, a load of worries? You know, we have people in the church that are worried about their sick children across the ocean. We have people in the church that are worried about uh, uh, all sorts of different things. Uh, a sick mother-in-law across the ocean, a sick mother uh, in, the, in the hospital. Uh, no matter what's going on, 
our Savior is still our refuge. And we can take our problems to him. That, that, those last two lines, I, I don't know who needs to hear this. But I don't know anybody who hasn't had a friend begin to despise and, and forsake them and, and maybe talk about them behind their back or whatever. You can't fix that. You can't fix that. But you can take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms, <laughs> he'll take and, and shield thee. Imagine uh, Nick or, or Bailey holding Charlie or or. McKaylee and Logan holding Graylin or Tyson. Boy, they're going to keep them from harm, right? That's the same thing that the Lord does for us, okay? I think I needed to hear that today, amen. Let me give you one more thing the Lord laid on my heart this afternoon. You know we're going to uh, talk about the uh, uh, eschatology today. We want to talk about the rapture and things of that nature. And uh, But the Lord put this on my heart today. Uh, it's a it's a verse of my dad. I don't, I, it's kind of unusual that it comes to mind. Uh, maybe I'm in trouble. Amen. When I, every time uh, as a child, you know, children are born sinners, right? And uh, uh, as a child, if I tried to hide something I had done wrong, when my daddy found out, he always took me to Numbers chapter thirty-two. And he once I learned to read, he made me read the words aloud. In Numbers chapter 32, it is written, Ye have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. For we can fool ourselves sometimes. We can fool our uh, fellow saints. We can fool uh, society. But we can't ever fool the Lord. Amen. I don't know who needs to hear that, but the Lord put that on my heart today. Amen. So let's talk about prayer requests. Uh, we have unspoken. I know several in the church have unspoken. The pastor always has unspoken. Um, uh, but let's talk about people. I don't mean that in a sense of gossip. I mean in a sense of praying. Uh, we've had on here for probably two and a half years now a list that says pray for the leading saints. Uh, the leading saints need to, to be sure that we're walking close to the Lord. Uh, we need to to uh, think of what the, so how the psalmist prayed. Search me, O God, and see if there be some wicked way in me, right? Even the Christian needs to uh, needs to pray in that fashion. The, the person who's faithful to church uh, several times a week needs to pray in that fashion. And we need to pray. Maybe we see some error. Maybe you see an error in the preacher. Maybe you see an error in, in, uh, in uh, one of the Sunday school teachers. Well, what do we do about that? We tell the Lord about it just like we sung about it a while ago. But let me tell you how we each could pray for pray for ourselves, okay? Good old song. Uh, first time I heard it was actually uh, Glenn Payne and George Yaunts singing the song, but uh, it is based on uh, Psalm 139, and the, the lyrics of Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. It's uh, the song, the lyrics of the song uh, are a little bit different than the lyrics of the verse or than, than what God put in the psalmist's heart, but it's close. Search me, O oh God. See, we oftentimes spend too much time searching everybody else. We need God to search us. Know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior, and know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. Hmm. Once we get that victory, that, that forgiveness, that freedom from sin, the next verse says, I praise thee, Lord, for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word and make me pure within. Fill me with fire where I once burned with shame. Grant me my desire to magnify thy name. We need to pray that for ourselves. We need to pray that for our fellow saints as well. We've also been talking about the gumption and the gall to witness and the wisdom as to where and when and how. We live in a society where uh, testifying for the Lord is frowned upon. 
Uh, sometimes it's ridiculed, different things, but we need to be faithful no matter what society says. Uh, we're still praying for uh, different families that are PCS and families that are separated by the military at this point, uh, several different families that uh, uh, have young people that are making life-changing decisions. Uh, we have the Sakuras who are going to PCS, uh, I believe, a week from tomorrow. Um, Katie and Michael are... Uh, going to Colorado to get married and then to Fort Seal and then to Fort Bliss, I think. I don't know that it's Fort Seal anymore. But anyway, whatever. They're going to Oklahoma. We need to pray for them. And there are different uh, other requests in the church. Pray for lagging saints. I actually got to witness, uh, invite one back to church this, this week and come to find out uh, he doesn't have license anymore. I thought perhaps he'd had a DUI or something, but... Uh, he said he had uh, too many speeding tickets, but either way, he doesn't have his license. Of course, I told him that uh, we could come get him, and I happen to know if things haven't changed, the church member lives up or downstairs from him, so try to work that out. Pray for lost souls. You know, we have a long list from from Mississippi to, to Malingen, Tennessee to Texas. I mean, just all over the country, and uh, we want to... Some of them are family members of church folks. Some of them are friends of church folks. And we just want to pray that the Lord would save souls. Amen. Um, the next thing that we typically pray, pray about is the church. The church is the cornerstone of society. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.15 that it's the pillar and ground of the truth. Uh, that's why, you know, I don't just... <clears throat> just flip my Bible open and preach from it, I spend, uh, whether you realize it or not, and I'm not bragging, I'm just trying to get you to understand it, uh, most of the time I spend anywhere from 10 and sometimes 30 hours putting together a sermon. And it's not uh, some of that sitting in front of the computer, some of that's mulling over the verses in my head, uh, but I, I, it's, it's an important thing to preach and to, to teach God's word. That's why the first thing underneath our prayer request for the church is to pray for the pastor, uh, for him to preach as the Lord would have him to preach, all right? Uh, pray for your fellow saints to be encouraged. That's important. Uh, pray for visitors to get in and fit in. And, and we can see that the Lord's answering uh, that uh, prayer request as we've seen a high of uh, the mid-80s and and. Lord willing, in 2024, uh, in a time to get and a time to lose, a time to get godly uh, habits and or actions, if you will, and attitudes and, and even associates, godly friends, and a time to lose ungodly actions and attitudes and associates. Hopefully, during that time, we'll see that number going up even more. I pray it doubles. Uh, pray for the lost to be saved. We had several weeks in a row where we filled the baptistry, and I'd kind of like to see that happen again. Amen. That's what God called us to do. So let's pray about that. And then we want to pray for our sister churches, okay? You know, <clears throat> I'll bring it out some when I preach on Sunday, but sometimes there's animosity between churches. Sometimes between churches... It, it becomes like uh, Tennessee and Georgia or, or Florida and, and Florida State or Florida and Tennessee or even more. Probably the two most obnoxious, three most obnoxious rivalries I know of are Alabama and Auburn, Ole Miss and Mississippi State, and Michigan and Ohio State. I don't know of any rivalries that are any greater than that. And sometimes we act like that between churches. But the fact of the matter is, whether we're talking about former pastors here, like we saw Paul correct in 1 Corinthians, or whether we're talking about other pastors across Germany, it shouldn't be a competition between us. That's why we've listed out um, Rhineland Baptist and Grace Baptist and uh, the church in Grafenvere and the church at Eiffel where Brother uh, Stephen Kissling is, is filling in for uh, Brother Rusty who's on um, a furlough. Uh, Brother John Radank and Ansbach Baptist, and we've got folks from here that have gone down there, folks from down there that have come up here, amen. V Spotten Baptist with Brother Wolf and Ryan River Baptist in Mannheim and uh, Victory Baptist in Stuttgart, and we got 18 different missionaries that 
that we actually financially support. We should pray for them by name. Uh, just one little update. I sent a uh, picture to the thread, but I know not everybody that comes and not everybody that listens by way of online is part of the church thread. But uh, Fausto D'Amelio's wife uh, had uh, uh, their son uh, the first week in February, I mean, first week in January, and uh, boy, he's a, a pretty little thing, and um, we're just praying for him to grow. What? He's tiny, Miss Denise said. Um, we've already mentioned that the Sakuras and uh, Katie are uh, PCSing pretty soon. Uh, Roberto and Emily are getting married on March the 2nd here at the church. Now, they're having a a government wedding, I don't know if that's the proper term, on uh, February 29th. I told him he's trying to save money on those anniversary presents. Amen. Going to have his anniversary on leap year on the one day that doesn't repeat the other three. But they're going to have a church wedding on March the 2nd uh, here at the church. And so uh, we want to pray for them. Uh, Katie and uh, uh, Michael are going to... Uh, the states to get married and to go to her next duty station. I want to pray for them. Uh, Colin and uh, his girlfriend are praying about getting married. Colin's been moved back down to Ansbach. The Dietrich family is going to PCS this year, but uh, it seems like Darla told Denise that's going to be a little later in the year. So thankfully, we'll get to keep them a little longer. Amen. And the Sakuras are leaving, like I said, a week from tomorrow. We want to pray for them. We're continuing to pray for the Hamilton family in Mississippi as they try to reconcile. Praying for the Cantrell family and the Barnes family who've recently gone through divorce. And the Mitchell family, I should add the Mitchell family to that, who've recently gone through uh, divorces. And I'm trying to encourage uh, uh, the people involved in those. Uh, we're praying for Karen and Brian Thomas, uh, some good Christian friends of ours in um, Iceland as they try to uh, minister to their family. I did, I think I gave an update to the thread, but I had asked y'all to pray for the emergency worker in Iceland who I would compare his job to Logan's in that he is, uh, you know, working road maintenance and things of that nature. But anyhow, somehow he fell off into one of those fissures caused by the um, volcano. And after four or five days, they actually had to give up the search for him. The fissure was um, close to 100 feet deep with water in the bottom and jagged sides, and it was just too dangerous. And uh, that young man have no idea of his, of his uh, eternal state, but I do know that he left a wife and kids, and so we want to continue to pray for that family. And uh, Kira brought it to the church's attention. One day this week through the thread, there was a fatality on the Audubon, don't know who it is. We need to pray for them. Uh, there's an unnamed couple in Mississippi that's having some um, family problems, and I have it written down, the Panero family as well. We continue to pray for revival, and y'all know we're in the midst of revival right here. Not talking about the services, but in what God's doing. You know, there's a vertical aspect to revival we preached about, how we turn God's own people uh pray, humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways and we begin to worship him right and then that precipitates a horizontal aspect to revival and I can't help but believe that a lot of the growth that we're seeing is because we began to humble, pray, seek his face and turn from our wicked ways and we want to pray that that continues not only at heritage but across the country. Uh, we have several people that either are or could be deployed. We want to pray for uh, their uh, protection in that, and uh, we want to pray for God's will in the coming elections. Uh, we have multiple members of our military that are here with us uh, <clears throat> that are stationed here. Uh, we've got Abe, Jeremy, Nick, uh, Katie, uh, Mike Garza, Colin, who's just gone down to um, Ansbach. We've got Logan, uh, uh, Amber Lynn is a lady who came to the church some. We've got Darla. Uh, Josh is here. Uh, Ross was coming for a while. I think he's settled at another church. Roberto. Uh, we've got Juan. Uh, we've got Jesus. We've got Kingsley, James, Anthony, Stephen, and there's still others. I'm sure uh, 
Brother Trudell, uh, Nick, I don't remember. No, I read Nick's name. Several people. But we need to pray not just for the active military that we know, but for all of our active military. That's a very important part of our country. And if our country sees revival, we need to see them have revival. Uh, of course, we pray for our reservists, Bo and CJ, closely associated with me. Amen. We want to pray for them. Toby Smith, y'all might remember I went every day for some time out to um, uh, Lonstool to see him. I talked to him yesterday, um, and uh, they're actually doing the paperwork for him to go home. So his back seems to be back in order. I think he's going to end up discharged over it, but... We didn't actually talk about that yesterday. I was just glad to see uh, that he um, was getting to go home. Amen. Uh, we pray for those of us who work not in the military, but for the military, and that's uh, Dan and Ann. I, I guess they got extended, uh, I hear from Denise, so I'm thankful they'll still be with us. Uh, uh, Derek works for the military, and now Miss Bree works for the military. Uh, Phil and Ceci, and myself and Denise, uh, Corey. Uh, Leon, unless he's changed jobs, works for the military, uh, sort of. He works on the base, but I think for a German contractor. But anyway, we want to uh, continue to pray for the, for all of us, okay? Uh, we've already talked about the PCS. We've already talked about the hot spots. We've already talked about the upcoming marriages. Let's talk about health, and uh, we'll quickly close and, and get into prayer and then start with our sermon, or really more of a lesson tonight. We'll Preach on Sunday, amen. Uh, Kayla is was back in the hospital yesterday when I typed this out, but I called the Marquez family and got an update before we started today. And she has been released. They've kind of tweaked her medicine. But, you know, mentally, if you can imagine throwing up for weeks on end, she's uh, a little fragile, amen. We want to pray for her. Sigrid, uh, uh, Joe's friend has fallen. Um, I think she's managed to, to get up from some comedy Joe sent today. But anyway, we want to pray for her. Still praying for Doug's mother's jaw. Uh, still praying for Lon, who seems to have the same thing that several of us have had, a, a bad cough and uh, some congestion. But it turned out, as with me, not to be COVID. But uh, we want to pray for her. You know, she is getting on up in years. I won't tell her age, but we need to pray for her health. Phil has a couple of unspoken health needs. Uh, Joe has a, a uh, surgery coming up. He's going to have to go to the doctor a couple of days before, and then a surgery, I believe, on the 29th of this month. Uh, praying for Brother Derek's heel to continue to, his heel to continue to heal. Amen. That's H-E-E-L to continue to H-E-A-L. All right. I'm from Alabama. Might not get that, but if I don't spell it, but uh, praying for BJ's uh, health and uh, for his chef's knowledge to uh, try to use his diet to correct the health problem. Still praying for uh, Candy Vizina. Uh, Brian Thomas, the man we're praying for him to reach his family for Christ, also has uh, prostate cancer. And Stephen Lamont has uh, uh, cancer in several places in his body. They're really not giving him a lot of hope. But he is, his main prayer is that God will use him during the illness, whether he heals him or not, to reach people for Christ. Most importantly, I believe, would be his own son. Okay? We're praying for Chamberlain's mom. I meant to call and get an update right before we got started, but time got away on me. Uh, McKaylee is still under some treatment uh, for a particular uh, chronic issue she has. We want to pray for that. Uh, uh, Chamberlain has several people in her family that we're praying for health-wise. I'm not going to name the names because I know some have passed away, and I'm not 100% 100% sure I have that right as to who has. And then um, my buddy Gary McCraw, who had a, a, a double stroke, we're praying for his healing. He, he has made some progression, but I haven't been able to contact him in a couple of weeks. Of course, we're praying for the schools. Most of the schools around here are closed. In fact, I think all of the Dodea and German schools are closed tomorrow. We're praying for the homeschoolers. And then praises. It's important that, that we praise the Lord. <clears throat> uh, the church is growing. That's a good thing, amen. Here's something that you need to understand. You ready? Everybody listening? There's six people tuned in, it says on this little screen in front of me. And I got three people standing in front of me. So I hope the 10 of us are listening. 
when God starts blessing, Satan is going to start cussing, okay? So there's going to come, I don't know if it's going to be uh, gossip. I don't know if it's going to be some financial or health scare. I don't know if it's going to be some uh, false accusation against a pastor or some leader in the church or whatever. But Satan's coming for us because he doesn't like to see God's name glorified. All right? But we do want to thank God for the church growth. Not everybody can say this, but some of us who've been here, we've prayed for two or three years. There are people in Japan and Oklahoma and Kansas and several places around the country who used to be here. Georgia, I'm thinking of. Texas, I'm thinking of. Angela, the Vinings, the, the uh, Lampleys, uh, Brother Parker. Those are the, some of the people I thought of in particular who are praying for the church to grow. God's answered that prayer, and we need to do what we say. Almost every time we ask God to do something, we say, Lord, we will give you the praise and the glory if that you bring that to pass. So then we need to remember to praise him, right? Uh, people getting in and fitting in. I'm so thankful to see so much of that. And again, almost every day, Somebody has a question for me, whether it's by text message or by Snapchat. Uh, you know, there's uh, one member I talk to every day by Snapchat. Uh, there's uh, uh, people I text back and forth with. Some people send me emails. Some people just call me. But the fact that people want to dig deeper into God's Word, that's a blessing. Amen. And we, uh, we need to praise God for that. That's also another reason we need to realize that Satan's coming. All right, so let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to try to get into more of a lesson tonight. Uh, I'll kind of show you what we're going to go over, uh, and uh, uh, these are things that I studied out. I typed up myself, um, and though I'm sure you can find it by some other person, Hillary, for instance, her and uh, I think it was just her, shared with me uh, an outline similar to the one I shared last week, this one. Okay, and uh, when she sent it to me, I opened it up, and it turns out to be a, a preacher I know. It was actually a friend of my dad's. He actually taught my sister and my uh, brother-in-law and a couple of three other lifelong friends when they were in Bible college. Not where I went, but anyway, good man, Dr. Harold Wilm Wilmington. And Michelle, our outgoing pianist, by the way, she's prayed for growth, too. She's there. Pennsylvania, West Virginia, right in the woods up there someplace. But uh, she gave me uh, Dr. Wilmington's Guide to the Bible, which is an awesome book uh, that my dad read several times. Anyway, um, it was that's just another proof that people are growing and they want other people to grow. Amen. But let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you that no matter what goes on around us, Lord, that... Uh, you're in charge. I thank you that though we all face temptations, we all face difficulties, I'm thankful for the promise that even though you allow us temptations and trials that are common to man, you always make a way to escape so that we uh, can glorify your name, so that we can bear the temptation, bear the trial, Lord. We can't stop a temptation from flying overhead uh, you know, through our thoughts any more than we can stop a bird from flying overhead, Lord. But by your grace, we can not allow those, those temptive, tempting thoughts, uh, those sinful uh, ambitions to uh, nest in our brains, Lord. I just pray that you'd work there, Lord. I pray for all of these prayer requests from uh, the unspoken to the different things we want to pray for the church, for the, the leading saints, the lagging saints, and the lost sinners, Lord, for the marriages that we're praying for, for the revival that we're praying for to continue here in our church, Lord, for um, the, uh, the various health requests, Lord. Some are chronic. Um, some are uh, getting over major issues like Chamberlain's mom, Shannon, uh, some are uh, dealing with chronic stuff like uh, Chamberlain and McKaylee and 
and others, Lord. Some are praying to avoid uh, something becoming a chronic illness, that there might be a solution for it, Lord. Uh, and just various things there, Lord, from Derek's heel to, to BJ's uh, kidneys to so forth, Lord. We just pray that you'd work there. Uh, Lord, we pray for our fellow churches, that you would grow them, Lord. I pray in these uh, storms today and tomorrow that you would uh, keep your people safe. And uh, I pray that uh, you would empower me as I try to teach and preach this evening, Lord. I pray as we go through that list uh, from time to time, we don't do it every Wednesday, but I pray that we would uh, make a, a physical note of these requests so that we're alone, that we can pray for them, Lord. I thank you for the, the privilege of prayer, Lord. It is an amazing thing that sinners such as we can come boldly before the throne to obtain grace. Lord, we need you not only to save us, Lord, but we need you to live, to help us live for you. We need you to help us witness right. We need you to help the wives be the wives God called them to be. We need you to help uh, us husbands, Lord, be the husbands you've called us to be, Lord. We need you to, to, um, uh, Help us fathers be the fathers that you've called us to be, Lord. We need you to help help us help the mothers in the church to be the mothers that God has called us to be, Lord. We need you to help those of us who are, uh, those of our uh, flock, Lord, that are still in school, that are students, to, that help us to be the students that you'd have us to be, Lord. There are uh, at least three, four uh, that are uh, contemplating uh, further education, Lord, and they need your help. They need your grace. They need your direction, Lord. As as soldiers and airmen and DOD employees and so many different things uh, represented here in the church in the way of employment, Lord, uh, we need your grace to be the, the, the soldier or the airman or the sailor uh, that you'd have us to be, Lord, the, the, the DOD professional that you'd have us to be, Lord, uh, the preacher that you'd have me to be, the servants in the flock that you'd have us to be. Lord, we need you. We need your grace, but we also need your mercy, Lord. Not one member of Heritage Baptist Church can stand and say, as Christ did, who convinceth me of sin? Who could make an accusation of Christ for sin? Well, no one could. We all know that, Lord. But none of us could ask that same question. From the most spiritual amongst us, to the most carnal and fleshly minded amongst us. We all have sin, Lord, and we need your mercy, Lord. I ask you right now to forgive me of sin, Lord. I'm thinking of some particular things that I know your Holy Spirit knows, and I pray that you'd forgive me of those things, Lord. Lord, I pray as the, the old saints used to pray, if there's something that I've done, something that one of your church members have done, like old Job prayed, and maybe they don't even know they've sinned against you, then I pray that you would show them what that is so they can ask you forgiveness, Lord. Same for me. Lord, as I go to preach and teach now, I pray that you would just guide my words, Lord. We love you. We thank you for the message that you've given me that we've studied out for pages and pages of notes to cover the next three, four, five Wednesdays, Lord. But above all things, Lord, we pray that you'd give your people ears to hear. For it's in Christ's name we do ask it all. Amen. So, <clears throat> if you can't hear when I'm praying, I'm a little parched. Thank you, too. I think the herbs, whoever put the Cokes in the fellowship hall, I appreciate it. So last week, I know for both of y'all, both of these cameras is going to be backwards, but last week we talked about the crucifixion and resurrection, the church age, nobody knows how long the church age is, and the rapture. And all of us should be excited about the coming rapture. Uh, the rapture is going to be before the tribulational period. Now, we're going to talk about some, some oh, it depends upon how far we get into. First, I'm going to go through several verses that concern these things. And then hopefully I'm going to get into a little bit of my outline about uh, the doctrine of last things. But nobody knows how long the church age is. But at some point, excuse me, this is the church age. Uh, at some point, Christ is going to rapture the church. Okay? He's going to rapture the church. Now, there's a lot of people creeping up today to say, oh, no, he's going to do it in the middle of the tribulation period. 
Or, no, he's going to do it at the end of the tribulation period. No, the Bible says there's no condemnation for us uh, that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's Romans 8, 1. And over in Peter's letters, he wrote that uh, God has saved us from the wrath to come. The wrath to come is not talking about hell. It's actually talking about the tribulation period. We can include hell in it if you want to, but he's talking about the tribulation period. And then we have... Uh, the full second coming of Christ. Here, Christ is only in the air. Here, Christ is actually going to put his foot on the temple mount. And during that thousand year reign, the curse on the land is going to be lifted. The curse from mankind is going to be lifted. The curse from animals is going to be lifted. That's when the lion's going to lay down with the lamb and all that kind of stuff. And the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. We looked at that last week. But I have two pages of scriptures. Two pages of scriptures. You can see, it's just printed scripture. Okay? And uh, you can look it up with me if you want to. I looked it up earlier and put it on this page so I know I'm reading this directly from God's Word as if I had opened up my King James Bible. Amen? But just to refresh your memory, the second coming of Christ meaning the rapture, is covered for us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we start reading in verse 13, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now he's talking about, that. it's a metaphorical way to talk about death. There's a lot of people today that teach, oh, it's soul sleep. When you die, you just go into some sort of comatose state until Christ comes back. That's because they don't understand literary tools. Yes, the book of the word of the Lord, it is inspired, but God chose to use literary tools like metaphors and similes and, and types and things of this nature uh, that mankind uses to help us understand the word, all right? So when he's talking about people that are asleep, he's talking about people that are dead. He uses the same terminology uh, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We were talking about there was sin in the church there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And even sin as to how they took uh, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And he said, let a man, this is 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11 and verse 28, let a man examine himself. And so, after he's examined himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, because someone took the Lord's Supper with known sin in their life, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, many are dead, okay? For if we would judge ourselves, who wouldn't be judged. If we would judge ourselves before we do these things for the Lord, God wouldn't have to judge us, okay? But back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, we would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others uh, which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's the gospel, right? Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scripture, and he was seen. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep, those are dead, in Jesus will God bring with him. So there, they and their spirits are going to come with Christ in the clouds, and then their glorified body is going to, Come out the ground to meet them in the air. Let's keep reading. For this I say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, which means to come before, them which are asleep, those that have already dead. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven uh, with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So he says already that he's bringing them with him. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So their spirit is going to meet their glorified body. All right? Verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the, the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, most people that might teach you about this subject are going to stop right there. But it's very important. Even last week with my little introduction to this subject, I had two or three people contact me on thirty and said on the on the Thursday and say, Well, what if we miss the signs? 
What if we missed the signs? What if we missed the rapture, basically? And, and that's probably brought on. I think the, the millennial generation probably has anxiety that Generation X and, and boomers and so forth don't even understand because uh, those left-behind books were so popular during their childhood. Um, there's a lot of anxiety on their part. So it's important that we read that last verse. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So with this teaching about the second coming of Christ, you and I should be comforted that he's coming back. Now, the idea that we could miss the signs. Let me help you out. The Bible speaks of uh, God as our, if we're saved, it speaks of God as our father. So I think of all the times my dad came to pick me up before I got my license. Whether I was standing where he thought I would be or not, now he's not omnipotent nor omniscient nor omnipresent like our Heavenly Father. But he never left me. I never missed my ride home. When my father came to get me, he found me and said, come on, boy, it's time to go. I think of my own children. Bo and CJ played football. We allowed them to go to other events when their classmates were playing baseball or their classmates were playing um, basketball or some of the girls' softball. We let them go to those events. When we went to pick them up, we never missed them. Why? They're ours. We let Nathan and Emma stay. They, they, they... When we had them in the Christian school, they were young enough that they were on junior varsity, so varsity played after. Well, you know, those kids on varsity weren't mine. I, I didn't always stay for that game. But if my junior varsity players want to stay, I, I let them. And, you know, I never missed them. I never forgot to come back and get them. Don't, don't let Satan make you afraid of the rapture. What we need to be concerned about is are we working and watching for Christ to come back. It should be a comfort that he's, he's our Father. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's the bridegroom for the church, so the church is his bride. You know, when Denise and I got married, when I drove away from the church, I did not leave Denise behind. I tried to get her to ride away on my motorcycle, but she wouldn't do it. But we got in her car, and we drove away together. I, I, I've never left my bride. Never. We have forgotten her purse and had to go back and get it. But I have never left her anywhere, okay, that I didn't go back and get her. Christ is not going to forget us. He's going to come back, and we're going to go with him. But we, so we should be comforted, but we should also be convicted that we should be found working. Another illustration that I've given you, and I'm going to show you here in the scriptures in a second, but another illustration I've given you time and time again is that uh, when my dad had a 67 Ford truck, which became my first vehicle in 1983 when I was uh, legal to drive. I was driving before that, but when I was legal to drive. On Saturdays, when I was a young man and didn't have a job outside the home, he always left me a list of things to do. In fact, I got two lists. My mama left a list on the inside. I had to clean both bathrooms in my room and make sure my laundry was out where my sister could take care of the laundry. And then I had to cut the grass, pick the purple holes, pick the okra, pick the melons, whatever. Long list of stuff to do. If I did what he wanted me to do, boy, I was encouraged. To, I was longing to see that red truck pull up. But if I messed around and got to watching wrestling and got to watching Tommy Wildfire Rich come off that top rope or see Bill Dundee whoop up on Tojo Yamamoto or whatever, then I didn't want to see that truck come. You and I should be living our lives so that we can be like Joe and say, maybe today. Maybe today, maybe today he's coming back, right? We need to live our lives that way. So let's talk about some scriptures here. The Bible says in Malachi 3.1, I'm not going to read you the whole verse just for the sake of time, but it says that the Lord, 
whom ye seek shall come suddenly to his temple, even uh, to the messenger, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord. Now that, I don't believe, is talking about the rapture because it says he will come quickly uh, to his temple. So I believe that is not talking about the Lord coming back here to get the church, but it's talking about him coming back after the seven years tribulation because he's going to the temple. Now, if you read Matthew 24, it says, verse 27, as lightning cometh from the east and shineth even into the west. You've all been there, especially if you live in, in, in the south part of the United States. I don't know all places that lightning is big, but in the southern part of the United States on a summer night, it might even be clear with no clouds and lightning can spider web across the entire sky, east to west. And it just, and it, it comes and it goes lickety split, we say down south. All right. The Bible says, for as the lightning, so as the lightning come, cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So it doesn't matter. Shane is retired and he no longer works on a sub. But let's, let's, he's got, a, I think, a nephew that he helped get into the Navy that's on a submarine, I'm sure. And if the Lord came back and that boy was however deep in the ocean uh, that the submarines go, if he's born again, when the Lord comes back in the sky, he's coming out of that water and he's going. I don't care if you're deployed to to Poland, if you're deployed to some unspecified place in the Middle East, if you're deployed to one of these uh, African countries where we have military troops at, if you're deployed to any place in this world, men, women that are in the military, if you're deployed, it doesn't matter where you are, east or west, he's getting you when he comes. It's going to be quick, and he's going to get all his people. But if you look at it, let's talk about expecting it. Talk about missing the signs. Talking about the world. You look a little later in the verse, that, that's talking about the rapture, verse 30, uh, 27. Verse 37 and following, I think, is also talking about the rapture, but listen to this. It says, now, in your King James Bible, it says N-O-E, okay? They didn't have uh, what we would call standardized spelling when this was uh, translated, and the one that we use is actually about... Uh, I, I always do wrong when I do math in front of people, but about 160 years after 1611 is when the one that we use came about. Not quite 160, like 158. But they still didn't have standardized spelling. If you look in our own founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and such as that, you will see some words that look like they're misspelled. And, and sometimes if it's a digital copy of these documents, you'll see S-I-C, sick in the text, and that means, hey, we put it on the text the way it was in the original document. That N-O-E is Noah. And uh, phonetically, you can pronounce it Noah, okay? We would say no, unless you're from Mississippi and it's your last name, then they all say Noe, but Noah. But as the days of Noah were, this is Matthew 24, 37, talking about the rapture, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, part of that is talking about the rapture. But I really think the the the, the best interpretation, explanation is a better word, I believe, of that is talking about the complete second coming. I used to think that there was going to be chaos. Derek's got a picture that was painted in, oh, I think 1972. He's got it displayed in his classroom back there. And uh, I used to think there were going to be wrecked cars and downed planes and all these crazy things. And here lately, I don't think that we're going to be that awfully missed when we go to heaven. They're not going to realize that we're gone until he comes back and there's a battle of Armageddon and they're all destroyed, okay? I believe that's talking about the second coming where he's actually... In other words, I think that's talking about this place where he comes back to set up his thousand-year reign. If you look in Mark 13, 35 and following... The Bible says, watch ye, therefore. That's all, y'all. Pay attention. 
Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, at dusk, at midnight, or at the cock crowing. So you don't know if he's coming in the evening, in the middle of the night, or in the morning. Or in the morning, or in the early morning, or in the middle of the morning, uh, if you will. Let me read that again. For you know not when the master come, of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Lest come suddenly he finds you sleeping. And watch, I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. So he starts it out with, pay attention, watch. He ends it with basically uh, three times, watch, because we don't know when he's coming. We don't know what time of day he's coming. We don't know on what day he's coming. So the church should always be working, witnessing, and, and living wise or Christ-like lives. John 14, 1. Now you may say, that's got nothing to do with the second coming of Christ. But it does. Let not your heart be troubled. Those people that contacted me last Thursday, most of them were stressed. They were troubled. They were worried. Okay? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Like the evangelist taught us at Christmas time. I mean, how many times, how many sermons have we heard as it took the Lord eight days or six days, excuse me, to create the world and he's been preparing a place for us for 2,000 years. No, it doesn't say there will be a houses in my father's uh, in my father's house there will be many mansions but there are many mansions in my father's house are many mansions going to prepare a place for us is talking about him going to the cross to pay our sin debt I'm going to prepare a place for you and if I go no if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you I'm paying your sin debt and if I go and prepare a place for you if I go and pay your sin debt I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, and there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way, you know. In other words, he went to the cross to pay our sin debt, and then he's ascended. And, but if he went to the cross to pay our sin debt, he's going to come back and get us so that where, we, where he is, we can be. And that's what our scripture about the second coming said, right? Comfort yourself with these words. And the previous verse said, so shall we ever be with the Lord. All right, look at Acts 1.10. Now, we can almost all quote Acts 1.8. You shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you. That word power is, is uh, uh, dunamis. It's, it's God's powerful strength uh, to preach, basically. We can mostly all quote that. But if you look in verses 10 and 11, the Bible says, while they, so, so they walked out, Christ has ascended, or they have, Christ has walked out with them to the hill, and they have watched Christ ascended. Now, when this book is written, the book of Acts, this has happened some time before. The book of Acts was, was, was penned, God inspired it, but it was penned 30 years or so after the uh, actual ascension of Christ. So this, when I say he had ascended, I mean this is written sometime later and the Holy Spirit is empowering Luke to give us the story that he has heard from the other people who were there. But it says, while they, while these 120 disciples stand looking, they're, they're, so you do not have done the same thing. Can you imagine if we were with Christ, we're walking with Jesus Christ himself and we leave the upper room where we've been meeting and we walk out to this hill and while we're talking to him he just begins to 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 flood i don't know exactly how he ascended i know the way he ascended is the way he'll come back and i know he went up in the air in my mind he just began to to rise up in the air like a like a helium balloon you let go right and they're just standing there looking at him just standing there looking at him just like you watch a balloon and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. The wind might move the balloon, but I believe the Lord went straight up. They were looking steadfastly towards heaven, the Bible says, as he went up. And then all of a sudden, behold, pay attention, look, behold, 
Two men stood with them in white apparel. Two angels, two men stood with them in white apparel. Which also said, these two men said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up to heaven? Hey, why are y'all looking up that way? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So he's going to come back. They watched him in the air. He's going to come back in the air. That's what we talked about, right? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. That's what we talked about. That's the way it's going to be. Uh, we've already read 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and following. Look, 1 John 3, 2. Take a moment. Turn to 1 John 3, 2. 1 John 3, 2. How many times have you seen a picture of Jesus, right? There's an actor. His name is Jim Cavziel, I think. And he will often say, I'm Jim Cavziel. I portrayed Jesus in the Passion. I mean, if I portrayed Jesus in the Passion, I'd probably be proud of it too, amen. <clears throat> but honestly, does he look like Jesus? Most everybody I know would say yes, but none of us know what Jesus looked like. None of us. None of us know exactly what he's going to look back look like when he comes. We can read different different things in Scripture to tell us different things about the way he's going to appear, but they're all like they're not microscope pictures; they're telescope pictures. They're they're far off pictures of what he's going to look like. All right. So read with me, 1 John 3, 2. You should have had time to get there by now. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. So he's writing to believers. Now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. You hear people all the time talking about, I'm going to go to heaven, I'm going to get my harp. In fact, one of my favorite funeral songs talks about a harp uh, with perhaps a thousand strings, all right? Um, talk about our wings. It doesn't yet appear what we will be like. But we know that when he, Christ, shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Two more quickly. And I should probably close with the two more. But Jude, verses 14 and 15. Jude. You didn't give us a chapter, preacher. I don't have to. There's only one. Jude, chapter four, I mean, verse 14 and 15. The Bible says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam. So Adam, Seth, I don't remember them all, Enoch. All right, like, 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 like Nathan, John, Stuart, Lewis, Jim Henry. You got it? The seventh one after Adam prophesied of these saying prophesied he's talking about these people that that speak evil of dignitaries and they talk about people and they don't really know the people and they have no basis for what they say he prophesied of these behold the lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and con and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. What? I'm going to read it to you again. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, he foretold, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh. And now, people, I mean, just rabbit trail. I'll shoot the rabbit in a second. But rabbit trail. People say, oh, what about the lost book of Enoch? It's quoted in Jude. So is Heraclitus quoted in, in John, in Acts 17, and in Titus 1. But Heraclitus is not inspired, neither was this writing inspired. And yet they know from this uninspired writing, like a biography of some kind that they had access to that we don't, that Enoch preached about the second coming of Christ, all right? Maybe he didn't even understand it was the second coming, but he preached about it. I'm going to read it again. The seventh from Adam prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That's talking about 
this one where Christ comes, the Battle of Armageddon, he sets up his uh, kingdom, and then at the very end of the kingdom, there's the great white throne, okay? So he's either talking about the judgment of the Gentiles here, which I think he's talking about, or he's talking about the great white throne. One of those two. He is not talking about the rapture. Well, what's he talking about to convince the ungodly of their ungodly deeds which they ungodly committed in their ungodly speeches? Well, if you don't remember, as oftentimes as I try to quote it to you, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, Jesus, that at the name of Jesus every, <coughs> every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. Already saved, 50-50 shot already burning in hell. It doesn't matter where that ungodly person is. It doesn't matter if we're talking about saved people or lost people. Let me read it to you. I mean, let me quote it to you again. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Every knee. Every knee should bow. Of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. And every tongue should confess what? That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I don't care if they're going to hell. I don't care what their final judgment place is, what their final eternity is going to spend. If you're saved, you'll, you will joyfully say, Jesus is Lord. If you're lost, you're going to say it maybe with a tear in your eye or maybe even just shaking with anger. But you're still going to say, Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Last verse I'm going to give you. And we'll pick up with the outline next week, okay? We're going to pick up, not, I don't know, outline's a bad word. We're going to pick up next week and we're going to cover the different, the different things. I thought it was important for you to see all the different scriptures uh, about the second coming of Christ. And, and understand, as I have tried to make it abundantly clear, that the second coming of Christ is in two phases. The rapture, the judgment, uh, the the rapture, and when he actually comes back for uh, the battle of Armageddon to set up his thousand year reign. Okay, and we're going to talk about all the different perceptions of of what that might be. But I thought it very important for you to see those scriptures where that comes from, and I need you to understand this: that in Revelation twenty two and verse twenty, he which testifieth of these things saith. Now, if you've got your Bible open to Revelation 22, 20, you will see that those next one, two, three, four words are in red, so we know Jesus spoke them. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. To which John said, Amen. Even so, come quickly. Listen, Christian. The Lord's coming back. You and I should be comforted by that. And we should be convicted that this is a time to get and a time to lose. A time to get closer to God. To get godly associates, godly actions, and even godly attitudes. We should be convicted by the fact that Christ is coming back. That this is a time to lose. A time to lose ungodly actions, ungodly associates, ungodly attitudes. A time to pray that we would be blessed. That we would have his grace as we prayed at the beginning of the service. To do more for the Lord in 2024 than ever before. You like rhymes, don't you? I do. Because they make things easy to remember. We should be convicted. So that you and I are working and watching for him to come back. But we should also be, also be comforted because he'll never forget his own. Remember, they're hireling shepherds. And then there's the chief shepherd. The hireling's in it for the money. The chief shepherd is in it for you. Ninety and nine safely lay. But the chief shepherd went out to seek that one lost sheep. And at one time, Christian, that was you. At one time, that was me. He went out across the hills and found me. 
1978. He went out across the hills and found Denise in 1978. He went out across the uh, hills of Rhineland Falls and found Joachim Bindhart in 1978. Now, I don't know when he found you. Nathan was a, a little lad when he called on Christ and his mother and himself and I were talking, I think earlier today, and putting places and events together so he could say, oh, it was in 2011. In 2011, the shepherd went out and found Nathan. Hmm? When did he go out and find you? If you're his, you can be comforted. He's not going to leave his sheep. He is not going to leave his son. He's not going to leave his bride comforted and convicted. Lost person, you ought to be concerned because he's coming to convince the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and their ungodly hard speeches, which others have heard. But I say, why not today? Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the eight or nine people that tuned in for uh, the sermon tonight. I pray others will tune in later, whether it be by Facebook or by YouTube. I thank you for my loving family who joined me over here uh, as I preach, so I'm not preaching to an empty room, Lord. But I thank you for that dear brother who called me earlier just to check on me. Hey, you know... I, 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 I just want you to know, preacher, I love you. If I, could, if I could choose my father, I can't. God chose my father. But if I could have chosen my father, preacher, I just, just want you to know I'd choose you. Boy, Lord, I'm thankful for encouragement like that. Lord, I'm thankful for those texts from church members who say, hey, that was a good one. Praying for you, preacher. Lord, I'm thankful for church members who just like anybody else, occasionally need to be corrected or redirected and they sidle up to you and say, hey, I understand what you said and I want you to know I'll pray about it. Lord, I thank you that there's an open line of communication from me to every person in this church, Lord, but way more important than that. I thank you that we all have an open line of communication to the very throne of grace where we can Find grace to help in time of need, and we can obtain mercy, Lord. Lord, as we preach about divisions in the church, because you laid it on my heart, I pray that you would heal any that might exist in our flock. Lord, I pray you would prevent that naysayer, that gainsayer, that gossiper, that backstabber from getting a foothold, Lord. I pray that you'd squash that old deceiver, Satan, and keep him from hurting your bride, your flock gathered here in mailing it. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done here in the last few months, uh, even in the three years that I've been pastor, Lord. But we ask you to do so much more. Lord, I pray to close this service. One thing that I pray almost every time. Purge us of sin, Lord. Clean us up. Start with this old preacher standing in these black boots. Prune us of unfruitfulness, Lord. Some weight, some unimportant thing in our life that's keeping us from being the witness or being the having the walk that we should have for thee, Lord. Cut it out. Lord, help us to be comforted and yet working and watching for your return. And as John said, even so come quickly. As Joe says so often, maybe today, we pray these things in Christ's name and for his honor alone. Amen.